Now, my name is Florian Haas. I run a professional services company um, named Hestexo. We've been an Ink Tank partner from uh, the time when it wasn't called Ink Tank yet. Um, and uh, we've been doing a fair amount of uh, Ceph related projects in a variety of fields. Um, for some of the slides that I saw earlier on, there were a bunch of logos of Ceph users. Um, quite a few of those are actually our customers that we've um, helped build up um, Ceph clusters and optimize them. And um, one of the questions uh, that we invariably get asked most of the time when we're doing uh, when we're doing Ceph projects or when people ask us to optimize their Ceph clusters is um, essentially how do I really make head and tail of uh, Ceph performance? So that is why. Um, I, I came up with this idea of doing a talk about uh, the demystification of Ceph performance. And I want, to, I want to tell you a little bit about the benchmarks that you can use, the tools that you can use to appraise your Ceph performance, and what are the real metrics that uh, are actually important. Tell me if you feel like this guy. Uh, when you've set up a Ceph cluster. Like, you, you've initially deployed it, you've run your Ceph deploy, everything's wonderful, you're finally getting that health okay. This is what I feel like every single time I set one up. So that's like the first thing. Um, I'm, I'm using Ceph deploy or, or, uh, or, or Puppet Ceph deploy or Ansible or whatever, and uh, we're deploying over potentially hundreds of OSDs across dozens of nodes, and finally everything works, I get that health okay, great, awesome. So that's like step one. That's the first thing that I want to get. But then the question arises, does it actually perform? Does it actually do, in terms of performance, what I can expect it to do, given the hardware and given the architecture that I have at my disposal? And if we want to look at Ceph cluster performance, generally the performance of any I.O. subsystem or storage subsystem in general, there's really multiple dimensions that we need to look at. So, for example, one of those dimensions that we typically look at is latency. So if we talk about um, storage latency, that means if I take essentially the smallest piece of, uh, of data that I can write to this thing or read from this thing, how long does it take? Right? So um, that's, that's one metric that might be very, very important, for example, in things like, say, database applications or any other thing that sort of is, is critical in terms of latency. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing uh, that we might be interested in is throughput. Now, throughput is an entirely different metric. So with throughput, we're not talking about what's the time that it takes to make the smallest possible write or read the write to or read from a storage system. But instead, uh, what is the amount of data that we can write to this thing at any given time? Right, so what can we do if we clobber it? And this is really important if what you're doing, for example, is streaming media storage um, and, or any other uh, kind of, of, of storage where you have sort of large amounts of data that you need to write at any given time or read at any given time. And then we've got IOPS. IOPS are essentially more or less the reciprocal of latency. So uh, rather than saying how much time do we take for an individual write of the smallest possible size that makes sense for my application, instead I'm saying how many of these writes can I do per second, right? So these are things that are, that are, these are sort of the important dimensions that we want to take a look at. And which of these is important for you or for your use case or for your application, guess what? That depends on your use case and your application. Um, and if, for example, you're, buy, uh, you're building a, uh, a streaming media storage application on top of Ceph, you're probably going to be most interested in throughput, uh, specifically actually in read throughput. Um, if you're uh, building something that is latency critical, then you're going to be more interested in latency or IOPS. Um, if you are building uh, a, a universal use uh, storage cluster that is going to be used for multiple applications, then most likely you're going to find some sort of trade-off. You're not going to be able to afford uh, optimizing exclusively th for throughput or exclusively for IOPS. You're going to have to find sort of a balance between that. And with those multiple dimensions that we have that we need to look at uh, in terms of Ceph cluster performance, uh, 
There's also individual components where we need to measure and, uh, and, and be aware of the, of the performance itself. So, for example, uh, we might be building an application that uses the object store directly, that uses RADOS directly. So we would be very, very interested in sort of our raw RADOS performance. Um, we would not only be interested in that, however, but we would also be interested in uh, what, are, what is the performance of additional layers that are on top of RADOS. So, for example, if you're building a virtualization platform, if you're building uh, an OpenStack or CloudStack or KVM or whatever environment where you're using your uh, Ceph as volume storage or as virtual machine storage, then you're probably going to be really, really interested in your, uh, in your RBD performance. And of course, RBD is essentially implemented as a client layer on top of RADOS. So you would have to be aware of what are the performance characteristics of your underlying object store, and then you can establish the performance characteristics of your RBD on top of that. Um, if you're using your Ceph cluster primarily for um, working with, a, uh, with, with clients, that use uh, RESTful APIs to interact with your object storage, then you would be very interested in your RADOS gateway performance. And that implies that you need to be aware of the performance of your underlying RADOS object store, but you're also going to be worrying about the performance of your RADOS gateway servers themselves. How many of them you have, how your Apache is performing, how your fast CGI is performing, or your Nginx, or whatever it is that you're using as your um, as your proxy server implementation uh, on top of uh, or with with Rados Gateway, and then finally, if you're running uh, CephFS which is, of course, again, implemented as a client layer on top of RADOS, then you're also going to be interested in your POSIX file system performance, whether you're using the uh, Linux kernel as a client to interact with your CephFS, or whether you're using CephFuse, or whether you're using libCephFS and you're interacting with um, Ceph through, say, Samba or uh, NFS Ganesha or something else, you're going to be very interested in the performance of that as well. So you need to take a look, or you need to consider your uh, Ceph performance for multiple dimensions, latency, IOPS, throughput, but you also need to appraise your Ceph performance in multiple layers, RADOS, RBD, RADOS Gateway, CephFS. Um, so, there are several things that influence this, um, and um, the, perhaps at the most basic level, um, something that very, very clearly defines, well, not, not clearly defines, but greatly influences the performance of your Ceph cluster altogether, is essentially the local block storage on your OSDs. So, the actual stuff that takes care of RADOS objects being written onto some persistent storage. And that would be sort of your block storage ultimately on, on your OSDs, whether those are spinners or SSDs or Fusion I2O drives or whatever. Um, and that's going to be of crucial importance. But also, and this is something that we heard in the, in, the, in the previous presentation, another thing that is very, very important is your network performance, your network throughput and latency. And this, of course, includes both the client network, the network that your clients use to interact with your MONs and your OSDs, because remember, uh, one of the beautiful things about Ceph is it scales out I.O. really, really nicely. So that means every single one of your clients, um, direct RADOS clients, that is, that includes RBD, that includes CephFS, um, essentially talks to potentially all of the OSDs in the, in the cluster at the same time. So that's something that's very important. But likewise, your network connectivity between your OSDs is something that's really, really important because um, Ceph puts a lot of replication intelligence into the OSDs themselves. I'm going to go into that in a little more detail in a moment. So, multiple dimensions, uh, multiple application workloads, and then multiple things that sort of define your performance or influence your performance at a very low level, uh, most notably block and network. And when we want to benchmark Ceph, when we actually want to run Ceph cluster benchmarks, and this is where it sort of gets complicated or challenging, um, is when, whenever we want to benchmark, we basically have to benchmark across all these dimensions and um, with taking all of these use cases into account. So 
What I've put up here is essentially a little overview on um, of what types of things can influence your CEF performance at what level. And let me walk you through, through this essentially bottom to top. So at the very bottom level, this is down here, this is something that happens on our OSD nodes. We've got essentially block devices. We've got block devices that store data. Typically, uh, if you essentially follow sort of the design and implementation guides, then uh, you would have an actual raw block device that you use as your OSD journal. Um, and then, of course, you have the actual OSD file store, which is a file system that lives on a block device. But ultimately, your, uh, your OSD can never get any faster than the underlying block devices. That's sort of a pleonasm. That's sort of a given. So, um, we typically use, um, as a sort of a, a, a cost performance trade-off, we typically use relatively fast journal devices and we use relatively slow but high capacity file store devices. So it's relatively typical to build a Ceph cluster a Ceph, or a Ceph OSD in such a way that you have um, any number um, actually, not any number, uh, actually a relatively small number, uh, up to ideally 12 to 18 uh, maximum um, block devices, each of which, which are spinners, each of which holds a, um, uh, an, an OSD file store. Um, and then you've got a number of SSDs in there to hold your journals. And again, it's relatively typical for a single SSD to host multiple journals, uh, but generally speaking, you shouldn't really go over about four to six journals for any given SSD. And that then defines the number of uh, OSD file stores that you ideally have in the system. So for example, if you've got four SSDs in that system and you're putting six journals on each SSD, then you could arguably be running up to 24 um, uh, 24 uh, uh, block devices here for your file stores. So we've got the journal, we've got the file store block devices. For the journal, really the only thing that matters is what's the streaming throughput that I can get onto this thing. That's the only thing that OSDs actually care about. Um, with the file store, it's slightly more complicated because for a file store, we've got a file system sitting on top of it. One of the things that I really credit Sage for uh, in terms of early design decisions in, uh, in Ceph um, some of his early work actually had a dedicated file system called eBOFs at the time uh, in the architecture and he relatively quickly decided well actually there's no need to reinvent that wheel and it's perfectly fine to use the file systems that we have in uh, available in Linux and right now we essentially have three to choose from ButterFS, um, XFS and EXT4. For all practical purposes most people will be using XFS uh, for the time being at least, simply because it generally tends to outperform ext4 with the uh, Ceph OSD workload and because of course famously ButterFS is two years away from being ready for production and always will be, as some people have been saying. But like I said, it gets a little more complex because now we've got a file system and the file system has tunables uh, and the file system has makefs options and some of them make uh, Ceph perform better, some of them make them perform uh, worse, but this is another sort of big influencer in, uh, in Ceph performance. Then we've got the OSD, the object storage daemon itself. So the OSD, of course, uses the file store, it uses the journal, but the OSD also uses a fair amount of CPU and uses a fair amount of memory, and most importantly, the OSD has a truckload of tunables. So um, how exactly you tune your OSD is pretty important for your, uh, your overall Ceph cluster performance. So that's the daemon itself. So it's actually it's a piece of software that you can tune um, that is actually part of the Ceph stack itself. That's a big influencer of your overall uh, Ceph performance. Then we've got the performance of our network. And again, here, there's two dimensions to this. One is the network connectivity to your clients, to the stuff that actually uses your, uh, your Ceph cluster. And the other is the, the backhaul network, what we call the cluster network as opposed to the rather poorly named public network in, uh, in Ceph clusters. Um, this is where 
all of the, uh, among other things, all of the replication and backfilling and what, ha uh, what have you happens. Um, and this is also crucially important uh, for two reasons. One, uh, you have IO activity that's going on here in the background, such as recovery and backfill, uh, which somehow, which basically competes for IO cycles with your foreground IO. So that's something that you need to consider, and that's something where you can uh, where you can tune a fair bit. And the other thing where it's important is uh, we uh, in Ceph use something that we call primary copy replication. So anytime you write. Anytime a client creates a new RADOS object, um, the uh, object is written to the primary OSD for its placement group, and the OSD itself then takes care of the replication. But since this replication is synchronous, that means that uh, the client write is actually acknowledged only if the write has hit all of the OSDs that it should be hitting. And uh, it actually doesn't it doesn't suffice for it to just arrive over there, over the network layer, but it actually has to be committed at least to the journal. And then it's, uh, uh, and, and then it's acknowledged. Uh, while we have a sufficient degree of parallelization here, um, it still means that we've got this basically this two-step process of writing the primary, then replicating to a bunch of other nodes, and then acknowledging and so therefore, if you have a terribly slow network between your OSDs, um, or for that matter, slow journals on the other end, then that's going to get slow. So, and then what I think is relatively self-explanatory is um, it's important for us to have a, uh, a network, a, a reasonably decent network to our clients themselves. Um, so the network performance to all of these OSDs will greatly uh, influence the, the, the performance of our, of our client itself. And then we still have other items that sort of influence our overall performance, and that's the stuff that actually sits atop the RADOS client. So uh, that sits on top of libRADOS and, and libRBD, such as RBD itself or whatever uses RBD, such as, for example, QMU with the RBD driver and what have you, or CephFS, or if we're going through Rados Gateway, um, our Swift and, uh, and S3 clients. Okay, so a bunch of layers here that we need to take into consideration, but luckily we have really, really good tools uh, for us to uh, evaluate the performance of these systems bottom to top. And this is something that I would generally always advise you do. When you measure your Ceph performance, when you're trying to basically get a handle of how my Ceph cluster is, perform, uh, is performing, start at the bottom and work your way up to the top. Um, and a lot of that is as specifically stuff that happens here at the very bottom layer is stuff that you can do and should in fact be doing before you start deploying a Ceph cluster. You should get a handle on what is the actual latency and throughput that I'm getting out of these block devices that I'm about to, uh, to peruse as Ceph journals or Ceph file stores. And uh, some, of the, uh, some of the benchmarks, some of the tests that you can run here are actually destructive in the sense that they actually overwrite this device, uh, which means you shouldn't really be doing that you know, in a in a in a running uh, in a running Ceph cluster, so you can run really 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 super simple benchmarks on a block device using the ubiquitous DD tool. Okay, um, now this may be a little small, but you all have access to the uh, to the to the presentation, so you can always refer back to this. Um, if you use DD. What you're doing is you're basically writing uh, some data. You can basically get that out of dev zero, uh, and you're writing it to either a file or directly to a block device. And uh, what I've put up here are two benchmarks. The top one is a super simple micro benchmark for establishing your device throughput, and the bottom one is a super simple micro benchmark for establishing your device latency. What I'm doing at the top is I'm writing a full gigabyte of data to a device. And importantly, I'm doing so in O direct mode. You don't know how many of these micro benchmarks I've seen where people say, hey, I've got this and that performance, and they're neglecting to set O flag equals direct, or O flag equals sync, or O flag equals desync. And the only thing that they're effectively doing is measuring the throughput of their page cache. 
That's not what you want to do because we all understand that memory actually is faster than uh, than uh, than writing to an actual buck device. If you want to try that, you might as well just write to dev null and be happy. Um, so please set that O flag equals direct. O flag equals direct means that the uh, the file handle dd opens this handle on a file or the block device in O direct mode, which is an instruction to bypass the page cache uh, and actually write to the device. Also, you should make sure, I have an example of that where we see an effect of that uh, in a little bit. Also, you should make sure that if the device itself, the block device itself, has some sort of cache, um, make sure that you actually overwhelm this cache with the, with the, with the amount of data that you're writing. Because if you're not, then you're actually not going to be hitting the spindle, the platter, or, or the SSD, but you're just going to be hitting the cache. So uh, one gig, if, you, if you've got like a relatively small controller cache, like half a gig, then that should do it. You can also do two gig, four gig, whatever. Um, just make sure that you actually write that thing um, in a size that is actually larger than the cache. And the second one, uh, the second micro benchmark here, uh, is equally simple. What I'm doing here is I'm just uh, is I'm I'm writing the smallest amount of data that I can write to the device. If it's a spinner, then the the hard sector size is typically 512 bytes. So I'm writing in chunks of 512 bytes. Um, if it's a if it's an SSD, then typically those would be using 4K blocks. So in that case, I would be using 4K. Why am I doing this? Because if I'm using a smaller amount, what effectively happens is when that specific sector needs to be written, what actually happens if I just write 20 bytes to that sector is the sector gets read. 20 bytes get spliced into that sector in memory and then gets rewritten. So I'm actually not doing an actual write benchmark, but I'm, I'm benchmarking a mixture of reads and writes, which is stupid. That's not what I want to do. So uh, you just write again in direct mode. Uh, the smallest increment that you can write to the block device, you do that a thousand times, you get an overall time that comes out of that, you uh, divide that by a thousand, and you've got a reasonable average of your device latency. So let's take a look here at this really quickly. So what I'm doing here is uh, I'm doing this in a, um, in a Ceph OSD uh, directory. Um, kids don't try this at home because I'm actually doing this on a live Ceph cluster, uh, which subsequently was torn down and redeployed. Uh, you should absolutely make sure that you're doing this actually before you get started. But in this case, what I'm doing here is I'm actually writing uh, directly to the journal. You should see that in a moment. So here's my DD. So I'm running uh, from dev zero to the journal device, which is a symlink to, um, to a partition. And I'm writing one gig, and I'm doing that in direct mode. And what I'm getting here is 2.3 gigabytes per second, which I think is a little high. Um, and uh, now I'm doing the other benchmark, this is to an SSD with 4K, with a 4K block size, uh, writing a thousand times here. Let me stop that real quickly. Um, so I wrote this here a thousand times, 4K, and it took me 0 0.030 seconds. So in effect, the latency of a single write is 0 0.030 milliseconds, so about 30 microseconds for a, uh, for a write. And uh, there we go. And now I'm writing to the file store itself. And again, I'm thinking, hmm, this is a little strange, it's a little high, but it looks like we actually have a SAS cache here. So what I'm doing instead is I'm making it slightly bigger, and then I'm actually overwhelming the cache, and we're getting a much more, um, much more sane reading here of about 335 megabytes per second um, that, we're, that we're writing to the file store here. So, um, so that's a really, really simple way of, and this is again, this is the this is the latency, uh, this is the latency test um, to the uh, to the file store itself. Uh, so this is a really, really simple way of uh, of doing sort of a micro benchmark on your uh, on on your block devices. Um, you can do this in a slightly more um, elaborate fashion. Uh, who in here uses FIO? 
FIO, everyone knows FIO? Great, okay, cool. So FIO is a wonderful uh, and universal benchmark tool that um, is maintained by Jens Oxbo, who is the uh, block device uh, maintainer for the Linux kernel. Uh, FIO can do a lot of things. Um, in this case, what I'm doing is I'm trying to um, duplicate as best as I can the typical write load for a uh, for a Ceph uh, OSD journal. So uh, I'm using asynchronous I/O, so I'm I'm using the lib AIO engine here, uh, which is what the uh, what the OSD journal also does. I'm using direct I/O, which the Ceph OSD journal also does. Um, I'm giving it a, a random block size range of about 4K to 512K. Arguably, some journal writes can actually be larger than that, so feel free to play with this. Um, and in this case, uh, in in this instance, I'm writing 100 megabytes. Uh, 10 times, so I'm roughly writing a, gig uh, a gigabyte of data uh, at one time. And um, yes, I know FIO can plot pretty graphs, but I'm not going to give you those graphs because you're not going to believe any graphs that you see anyway. Uh, you, you probably want to run this yourself instead, so instead I'm showing you how to run this. Um, so I'm going back to my OSD here. And now I'm running a FIO benchmark in here. There we go. And I'm actually writing that to my journal. And then I get this pretty output here. Oops. There we go. So we're getting about 6.3 gigabytes per second uh, aggregate bandwidth, which is actually pretty cool. And then I can play a little bit with the block size range and, uh, and, and what have you. Uh, so here I'm actually uh, doing a, a hard-coded block size uh, of just 512K. And you can basically play around a little bit with, uh, with, with, with FIO there. And that gives you a really, really good um, understanding of uh, what, your, um, what, the, what the performance is of your journal devices and of your file stores. Now, what should you generally be expecting here? Uh, if you're working with SATA spinners, a SATA spinner that you're writing to uh, in streaming write mode uh, in direct I.O. Uh, will typically be able uh, to pull about, depends, anywhere between 50 and 80 megabytes per second. Um, and then if you are, if your SAS goes a little higher than that, and uh, if you go up into the SSD realm, it basically depends on uh, what kind of cache you want to spend on it, but it's relatively typical to see for streaming rights uh, actual measured throughput values of about 350 to 550, uh, 450 uh, megabytes per second with FIO for a reasonable enterprise SSD. And of course, if you want to shell out for Fusion IO or for any other like really, really high-end devices that can go considerably higher. One, uh, one thing that you should not think is because my SSD says on the tin that it's capable of pulling 450 megabytes per second, that's actually what my Ceph OSD will be doing. It doesn't work that way. Ceph OSDs, uh, in, on, on various occasions, basically decide to flush the journal to the disk. And whenever that happens, then of course you're also constrained by, the, um, uh, by what you can actually write to the file store. So uh, please do not expect that just because you're, you're buying 450 megabytes per second, um, OSDs, that's exactly what your, uh, what your uh, SSDs, that's exactly what your OSD is going to be pulling. Okay, um, so that's like, that's sort of very, very basic. It's really important to establish what your, uh, what your block devices can actually do at the very bottom. Uh, a network benchmark. I don't even have a, a screencast for that because I'm sure you're all very, very familiar with this. Uh, people typically just use NetPerf for that. Uh, all of um, Ceph's connections between clients and OSDs are regular TCP socket connections. So you can essentially just do a, a, a TCP stream benchmark here uh, with NetPerf. You can also play around with Netcat and basically DDing into a Netcat socket and things like that. But generally speaking, uh, NetPerf is what really helps you. So. That's how we establish what's the performance that we're, that we're getting at the block device level and what's the performance that we're getting at the network level. And then we can actually benchmark OSDs. And this is really, really helpful because it actually comes bundled with Ceph itself. So we have this wonderful ability to um, tell 
a running daemon to do something. And in this case, it's telling an, uh, an, an OSD to run a standardized benchmark. And we can do that with Ceph tell OSD dot OSD ID bench. And what comes out is something like this. So you basically do Ceph tell and then your OSD ID bench. And then what comes back is um, how much was actually written there and what block size by default is four megabytes. You can change that if you want to, and then you actually get a bytes per second back. And uh, as a general rule, what I always do, any benchmark that I run, is I run it at least three times and take an average. Because you might always run into some sort of fluke, some sort of cache uh, effect or, or something like that, specifically when the cluster is already in use. Um, but what's really nice about speaking of a cluster being in use, um, this is a non-destructive benchmark compared to the DD stuff earlier. So you can can do this um, basically with impunity on a running Ceph cluster. Yes, it might impact the performance of that specific OSD temporarily while you run it, but you're not going to shred your data. And that's really, really useful. Um, if you want to do something funny uh, to a specifically uh, a Ceph cluster that you don't maintain yourself, um, then do Ceph tell OSD dot asterisk bench with a really big value because then you're benchmarking all your OSDs at the same freaking time and that's really, really fun. <laughs> um, and, and, and this gives us, this gives us a, a, a great understanding of how our OSD, that is to say the combination of journal and file store, uh, works as a whole uh, and can point us to uh, things like um, you know, uh, I, I might have, like, for example, a misconfigured file store file system. Uh, classic example, uh, mounting XFS without inode 64, that tends to be sort of a, a, a performance issue, or things like that. Um, so, Ceph tell bench, really, really useful. Do run this, do use it, yes. Does that run locally on the OSD, or is it over the front side network? So the question was, does that run locally on the OSD, or does it run over the front side network? This is something where you can uh, connect from any Ceph client, uh, but it will run locally on the OSD. So this does, actually does not have any network effect. Um, or th this doesn't take any network effects into account. The next benchmark that I'm talking to does, because that's one step up. And then we've got a RADOS benchmark. And this is really helpful as well. So we've got, uh, we've got this tool called RADOS Bench. We basically tell it, do we want to do a, a, a read benchmark or a write benchmark, and for how long do we want it to run? So this is something where I can actually now sit on an actual RADOS client, uh, like for example, something that is meant to be sort of, for example, a, com a compute host for, uh, for, for OpenStack, a compute node. And I can basically figure out, okay, what's the RADOS, um, uh, what's, the, what's, the, what's the RADOS performance that I'm getting like from this very host? And this, of course, does take into account all network effects and whatnot. Um, what this effectively does is it creates a bunch of RADOS objects of the size that you specify. Um, and you can theoretically do this in any pool. Um, but what I like to do is I basically like to create a throwaway pool. I, I basically create a, a separate pool that I usually call bench or benchmark, uh, such that I can then throw away that pool with impunity. Um, so um, because uh, I, by default, this benchmark uh, removes the object that it has created, but if I uh, interrupt the benchmark while it's running with a sick int, or if I um, uh, or if I set the flag to retain the object so I can subsequently do a read benchmark, I've got all these objects in there in, in, a, in a pool that's otherwise used, and that's not a good thing. So just define your own pool for that and, uh, and then run your benchmark. So what does this look like? There we go. So I'm creating a pool here. And I do that with 4,096 uh, PGs in this case. This, this is another thing why you want to do this on, a, on your own pool because you can basically play with, with PGs and, um, and, and pool sizes and replication and whatnot. And now here I'm running a, a, a RADOS benchmark for 30 seconds. It generates this nice little sort of average overall appraisal of my performance. And what I'm getting here is exactly what I want on a 10 gigabit network, uh, which is my RADOS bench basically uh, yields that I'm uh, writing to RADOS at a bandwidth of about 1.1 gigabytes per second, um, which is pretty much exactly what I want in, uh, in, a, in a 10, I'm, I'm, I'm getting to the point where I'm actually saturating 
my, my network, which I'm really happy with um, in this instance. Yes? This is for uh, bandwidth more than latency, or can we run it for latency and tip it for latency instead of bandwidth? Um, you also get the latency here, see at the bottom? So you get you basically get your average latency standard uh, standard, the st standard deviation for your latency as well, and um, whether this is actually useful um, for 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 measuring the latency of your application essentially depends on you knowing what the minimum I/O size is of your application, like what's the minimum RADOS object that this thing will create. Um, for example, if you're running RBD, the actual smallest RADOS object is, or the RADOS objects are always uh, put into chunks of four megabytes, right? Um, and then setting the appropriate size here, like the the, the, the the appropriate write size here, and then it can then it can be a meaningful benchmark for for RADOS latency as well. Thinking on everything else, because both CephFS or uh, S3 will have a very small write on the metadata, uh, and the very big right, which is the object, so it's a more mixed environment in terms of latency versus bandwidth. Okay, that was a comment more than it was a question, uh, but uh, <laughs> that's fine. Uh, but yeah, I mean, you're right in the sense that, um, of course, uh, like specifically for CephFS, when you're writing large chunks of data and, and relatively small updates to, to metadata, then yeah, both of those would be both of those would be important. Um, but um, if it's okay with you, I'd like to take that question in the break um, because I still have a, a, a few slides to go and, uh, uh, and then I am the only person between a bunch of Englishmen and their tea, um, which, is, which is probably a, a, a bad position to keep people waiting for. Um, Okay, and then, so once we've established our, our, our RADOS benchmark, right, then we can sort of move up uh, into, into the client stack. And I'm, I'm starting out here, or well, the, the, the thing that, I'm, that I want to highlight here is RBD simply because uh, volume storage for, uh, specifically for virtualization, is one of the typical use cases uh, for, for Ceph. And, um, uh, and nicely enough, there is actually an engine, a, a back-end engine for, uh, for FIO that uses... Uh, libRBD. So rather than having to jump through any hoops of like mounting or, or mapping RBDs and whatnot, going through the kernel layer, layer etc., what you can use is a recent version of FIO that actually uh, supports the, uh, the RBD engine, and then you can talk directly using, using libRBD to your uh, to your to your RBD volumes uh, with FIO. So this has a few uh, sort of non-standard options here, uh, and, and some some of them are completely standard options. So you can also specify direct I/O. You should. Uh, you can um, uh, use any of the benchmarks that um, that FIO supports: read write, ran, uh, read write, random read, random write, streaming write, um, streaming read, whatever. You can also define a block size range, and these are the, sort of the specific options. You would say uh, your your pool, uh, your that your RBD volumes live in, and the RBD volume that you want to benchmark. And no, it will not create that volume for you. You create the volume ahead of time, and then you run your benchmarks um, against this. And uh, what does that look like? So this is basically uh, talking directly to RBD. And what I'm doing here is I'm, I'm just writing 100 gigabytes here uh, at a time, and I'm getting an aggregated bandwidth of 927 megabytes per second. So I'm still about 10% under uh, what I'm getting from raw RADOS, but it's still it's a, it's a pretty good result here for, uh, for RBD. And that, of course, fluctuates a little bit as I'm changing my, the, the benchmark types that I'm running. So here I'm doing a random write benchmark. Um, Ceph tends to perform awesomely well, specifically for random write benchmarks, as opposed to actually um, benchmarking a local device, because it literally doesn't care that I.O. is all over the place, because it hits OSDs all over the place. Um, anyway, so here I'm going up to about 900 megabytes per second, which is pretty good. Um, but of course, we've got something to uh, even improve that for uh, for RBD. 
and that is the cache. Um, you know, with RBDs, we have a we have a, a client side cache. Did you have a question? Quick one: Is that is that test running on a client separate from the cluster? Yes. Well, so the question was: Was this a, a test running on a client separate from the cluster? Yes, it was. In fact, I basically ran this on the same host that I previously ran the Rados benchmark, because that's kind of the way it makes sense. I've, I've got a specific host. I'm establishing its Rados performance, and now I'm running my my RBD test to see how that compares. Right. So no, this is. This does not run on the on the cluster. However, that wouldn't really make much of a difference because uh, Ceph doesn't really have um, any concept of sort of local affinity anyway, um, and and an RBD volume creates so many uh, RBD objects that because of the way uh, Ceph object placement and hashing works, it's distributed across the OSDs in the entire cluster anyway. So it doesn't make a whole huge difference. Uh, but to answer the question, it was on a, on a, on a node that was separate from a cluster vita. One question. Uh, did you ever benchmark a, was it a benchmark on a newly created volume or did you populate the volume uh, before you ran the benchmark? So the question was, was this a newly created volume or a volume that was previously populated? Um, this was a new volume that I ran several benchmarks on. I suppose you are referring to the fact that uh, RBD volumes are always thin provisioned and when we we, we, we basically have to uh, create new objects. Um, it hasn't been my experience, but I'll be happy to stand corrected about this. It hasn't been my experience that the creation of Rados objects, like the, 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 the point that we're creating the object is uh, creating the object and then writing four megabytes to it is significantly different from writing four megabytes to an existing object in terms of sort of the, 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 the performance metrics that we're generating. But like I said, I haven't tested this specific thing and I'll be happy to stand corrected. Um, do you have a rough idea of the size of this cluster? Uh, just for context sake. Uh, do, One do, node, ten nodes, a hundred nodes. Do I, do, I have a, do I have a rough idea of, a, of, the, of the size of this cluster? So, you mentioned ten gigabit networking. I was just wondering. Yeah. So, so what's what's the what's the size of this cluster? This is actually reasonably small. Uh, this is a cluster that runs approximately 20 OSDs on uh, four nodes, four OSD nodes in total. Uh, so, because of the way Ceph distribution works, you're generally expecting to get even better results as you scale out more. But in this case, even with this, we're saturating the 10 gigabit network, which we're kind of happy with. But the but the general idea is that as you as you as you scale out more, you can essentially expect you know even even better performance that way. Um, okay, so what about caching? Uh, we've got this wonderful uh, write back cache in uh, write back and write through cache in in RBD, and we can actually uh, measure the effects of that uh, with FIO RBD as well. But you we can measure it in a way that is perhaps a bit surprising uh, to some of you. And I just wanted to share that because it's a sort of a, it's, a, it's a thing that people commonly trip over. Um, so essentially exactly the same host. But what I'm doing now is uh, I first, so I run this, so this is without caching, right? So this is no cache and I'm getting 932. And uh, great. Oh, sorry, I, apparently I, no, there we go, hang on a sec. So that is 941, okay, here we go. Here's where I, well, stop, stop, stop. Let me back up here. So that's where we enable the cache. Ah! Okay, well, basically I set RBD cache equals true, and I'm running the benchmark again, right? Uh, here we go, and stop, stop, stop. Okay, so I'm running the benchmark again, and we had 940 megabytes per second earlier, thereabouts, right? And again, we're getting about 940 megabytes per second, or thereabouts, with the cache enabled. Why? So we've enabled the cache, and we're not really seeing any, any results here. Um, and this, this, is a, this is a bit of a tricky one. Um, Ceph has this wonderful feature where uh, an RBD client will operate in write-through mode until it receives the first flush from upper layers. Okay, so uh, when uh, when you when you when you've got an intelligent, say for example, virtual machine guest that is capable of sending down a, a flush request uh, into into lower storage layers, then Ceph says. Or, or RBD actually says, okay, so 
this client or this virtual machine actually knows what it's talking about. Uh, so it is going to send me flushes. So therefore, I can now enable write back uh, because um, it will, whenever it needs to persist data, it will tell me to, and then I can flush. Um, and uh, if you're running um, a, a virtual machine, for example, with a reasonably recent uh, vert I.O. driver in, in, in QMU, then it will do that. It will properly uh, pass down flushes. If you're using ancient virtual machines with a kernel of uh, 2632 or, uh, or older, it won't pass down these flushes. If you're using uh, legacy operating systems that nobody should be using anymore, like Windows, then um, if you're not using the, uh, the, the vert I.O. driver, then you're also not going to see these flushes. So what's going to happen effectively is Ceph is going to do the right thing for you and try to protect your data, which means that, okay, this thing doesn't send any flushes, so I'm just going to operate in write through mode the whole time and keep the write back cache um, disabled. And um, if you want to test for this in FIO, there is something specific that you need to do. So what I did here is I ran the FIO test, and uh, I, can, I continue now um, looking at the Ceph client uh, log here. So I, what, I, what I did here is I basically I set up this client um, to run with uh, a level 10 debug logging for, uh, for, for RBD. And uh, I'm grepping here for flush in the, uh, in the appropriate log, and I'm not getting anything there. And now what I did is I set, and this seems weird, right? I set dash dash fsync equals 10. Why did I do that? Because the RBD uh, FIO engine translates fsync into a flush. Okay, and, so, and then it actually sends the appropriate thing down the, uh, down the I.O. stack. And now I'm running the same FIO test again with the same cache-enabled configuration that previously only produced 940, only 940 megabytes per second. And now I'm running the same thing again with dash dash fsync, and boom, I'm up at one gigabyte per second uh, of throughput, and I'm also seeing these flush messages here uh, in, my, uh, in my admin log. So it says, okay, well, after 10 IOs uh, that got passed down, I saw my first flush, so I know uh, this guy that's talking to me knows what it's doing, and... Um, uh, uh, and, and so therefore I'm enabling write back mode. The reason why I'm telling you this is that, uh, like I said, a very common use case for, for Ceph and Ceph RBD is virtual machines. Most virtual machines are smart enough to send down these flushes. And so therefore what you should really do is you should um, basically benchmark your systems with something that also produces these flushes. So if you do it with FIO, with the RBD engine, then add that dash dash fsync equals something, and that something is after so and so many IOs, send an fsync. If that's zero, it never sends it, and that's the default, so it never, uh, it never flushes, it always operates in write through mode. Um, so you want to keep that in mind for, uh, for, for benchmarking your RBDs for use with, say, OpenStack or CloudStack or, uh, or, or KVM, uh, or, or libvirt. Um, so, and then there's other things that you can do to benchmark your Ceph cluster. So for example, there's RESTbench that you can use for uh, benchmarking your Rados gateway. You can use the same FIO tests on your CephFS. Um, you can use other file system benchmarks like IOZone or, or Bonnie++. I only have the problem that I can't imagine anyone would ever be able to inter interpret their output properly without tripping acid, and that's not something I do. Uh, so I, I, I tend to stay away from, from, from Bonnie and, and IOZone, but by all means, feel free to use those um, if you feel like it. And speaking of feel free to use, um, the same thing goes for these slides. All of my slides are under, uh, under a CC by SA license. Um, this GitHub link basically is the link to the slide sources. So if you would like to use some of this material uh, and share it with others and adapt it and remix it and whatever you'd like to do, please, by all means, be my guest and uh, do that with uh, all of my other presentations that I have up there as well. And with that, it's uh, 2.29, and I'm like uh, one minute short, so that's great. Um, you can find me uh, on Google+, Plus if you want to get in touch and uh, chat about uh, Ceph, or OpenStack, or virtualization, or high availability, uh, or parenting, brewing ginger beer, politics, gardening, and other things that you might be interested in. Uh, with that, I thank you very much for your kind attention, and I'll be happy to take more questions during the break. Thanks.